you are live now sir good evening everyone we welcome you all to chapter 12 of youthful web series under the agesis of irsi today's topic is one essential topic for both anterior as well as posterior segment surgeons we aim at the end of the session to understand the importance of an oculoplasty fellowship the implications the counseling and the importance of surgery for an oculoplasty patient we have a mix of youth and experience of oculoplasty with us today evening before we start the session we would ask dr himanshu mehta president of irsi to please inaugurate the session good evening ron thank you very much for inviting me thank you anshika puja we have a great pleasure for having dr santosh who has without any hesitation agreed to be with us sparing his real valuable time and inputs you can't miss this inputs and thank you guys for having a wonderful show in the past year plus to have a gold kind of meetings which you, which will be always there on youtube for the youth to always go back and listen to from all fields from anterior segment to posterior segment to oculoplasty this is the gold standard which can be set and this is how a, a, a session could be conducted you don't have to go for any more meetings lot of national and international good speakers who have come and shared their experiences understanding about the subject i mean i again keep repeating this that when we were studying and we were doing our fellowship we never had the opportunity to listen to such good speakers sitting at our home our time our place and getting the wisdom out of them thank you so much for everybody for sharing this platform it's been a great amount of information data understanding whenever a young person starts off his practice they are confused from multiple angles besides the settlement the age the fellowship which needs to be done what should be done whether or not this would be lucrative a person who has no background in ophthalmology is always very confused but all these super specialities which have emerged in the last 20 30 years and there are pioneers like dr santosh who has really done pioneering work and to have him here it's an honor and pleasure on behalf of irsi and thank you so much all the very best for this session and may you keep hosting such good sessions so that there is great learning and it's always there as a reference note because every word of wisdom all these speakers give is never going to be understood in one meeting you'll have to go back again you'll have to read it listen to it again decipher the depth of the knowledge but it will help you in the long run to to make plans to plan your career and how can you go about in any field thank you very much have a wonderful evening thank you so much dr mehta for your encouraging words uh, we now welcome our first speaker for this evening dr santosh honawar dr honawar is a renowned ophthalmologist and the current editor of the indian journal of ophthalmology sir is director department of ocular oncology and oculoplasty at center of sight hyderabad and director national retinoblastoma foundation the council of scientific and industrial research the apex agency of the government of india for scientific research awarded him with the shanti swarup bhatnagar prize for science and technology one of the highest indian science award for his contributions to medical science in 2009 he is counted among the top 2% of the world researchers in ophthalmology Dr Honawar is the only Indian ophthalmologist to receive the lifetime achievement award by the American Academy of Ophthalmology and the honorary fellowship of the Royal College of Ophthalmologists London UK. It's an honor to have you on the show sir. We welcome you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Can I start my screen share? Yes sir. First of all I congratulate IRSI for encouraging such an activity by their young cubs and the cubs for you know running it so smoothly so professionally the introduction by rohan was very professional of course pooja is always bubbly and anshika is also there and himanshu of course you look like the young brigade i don't know why you are the president already so the topic given to me was ocular oncology went to refer this is my favorite slide you know this looks like a busy clinic when you become a busy refractive or a cataract surgeon you'll have your clinic full of similar looking patients everybody seems to have a cataract everybody seems to have pterygium everybody seems to have pinkula etc but what is good what is bad and what is ugly although you might have seen this movie several times 
suddenly you know when all these stand together it's difficult to say who is the good one who is the bad one and who is the ugly one similarly tumors unless you look at the tumor very critically and look for a particular feature in each tumor it's sometimes very difficult to say which is benign and which is malignant for example this is a papilloma and you want to remove it, of course but histopathology would be mandatory because in a papilloma can be hidden squamous cell carcinoma and when a papilloma changes its color becomes say broad based papilloma is supposed to be pedunculated it becomes sessile base is indurated it is hemorrhagic then you suspect that it is turned into a malignant tumor this patient has several papillomas but one of which has changed its color so that is an indication that it is turned into malignancy and if you are capable of surgical excision with clear margins and cryotherapy of course you should go ahead with because this is not going to cause functional problems but if you want to refer this would be one such case so any change in color vascularity size of a lesion new onset induration base fixity are the ominous factors for a papilloma or if a patient is elderly and has multiple sudden crop of papillomas then possibly you should consider immunocompromised status a dry looking nodular ulcerated lesion with or without pigmentation is a basal cell carcinoma and here you need a protocol based management where the tumor has to be excised with 4 mm clinically clear margins with intraoperative frozen section margin control so is this squamous cell carcinoma excision would be as large as this so you need a good reconstruction and that would be a case for reference as well so all suspected malignant tumors need referral and these generally present as nodular nodulo ulcerative or ulcerative lesions with vascularity and loss of eyelashes now if you have two ladies like this elderly ladies with bumps in the eyelid which look like chalazion now which one is a chalazion and which one is not that's often a question and unless you evert the lid you cannot comment which one is a chalazion short of that without everting the lid if a lesion were to confine itself to the tarsus in a young individual without thickening of the lid margin or loss of lashes that generally is a chalazia but if it is higher than the level of the tarsus with thickening of the lid margin and loss of lashes that is generally not a chalazia both these ladies have lesions which are which is higher than the level of the tarsus and when you evert the lid the diagnosis is obvious both are sebaceous gland carcinomas so any nodular lesion in a atypical age group elderly individual with thickening of the lid margin as you see here and i i would show that in a high magnification suppose this posterior lesion was not present at all it was still slightly early you can still diagnose sebaceous gland carcinoma by looking at the thickness of the lid margin this is normal thickness lid margin this is almost twice as thick sharpness of the posterior lid margin it is sharp here in the area that is involved it is rounded and you can look at the meibomian gland orifices they are all lost in the area that is involved and a loss of lashes putting it all together even if the patient looks like as if he or she has chalazion this may be sebaceous gland carcinoma and even if you want to excise it or do a curettage go ahead but send the material for histopathology confirmation of which would mean that you have to refer it for an oculoplasty opinion and a lid uh, excision of the complete excision of the tumor so that is mandatory nodular tarsal base lesion with thickened rounded eyelid margin loss of lashes and loss of meibomian gland orifices is sebaceous gland carcinoma this is clearly not sebaceous gland carcinoma you can see nice round pouting um, meibomian gland orifices this is definitely sebaceous gland carcinoma now coming to a variant of sebaceous gland carcinoma which arises from the glands of zeis which is present close to the eyelashes that happens in the eyelid margin without a tarsal base lesion as such so you should be aware that zeis of zeis glands of zeis can also cause sebaceous gland carcinoma now coming to individuals with unilateral blepharoconjunctivitis this patient has unilateral red eye and when you look at the eye carefully you find that there is breach of the limbal barrier there is some amount of pannus or conjunctivalization of the cornea which may look like limbal cell deficiency or stem cell deficiency or even squamous cell carcinoma to you but when you evert the lid it's very clear that this patient also has sebaceous gland carcinoma because he has the same features widening of the lid margin rounding of the posterior lid margin sparse lashes and absent meibomian gland orifices so this is a variant of sebaceous gland carcinoma called the 
pegetoid variant and that is very dangerous and early manifestations of size gland pegetoid variant can look like this this is very subtle looks like inflammation but you can see that the lashes are bushy here there's sparse in the involved area and mubumin gland orifices are missing so this is definitely a early onset pegetoid sebaceous gland casting in benign tumors of course capillary hemangioma of infancy can be very safely treated with uh, propranolol currently but you should be aware of the systemic manifestations which are listed here listed here this is capillary hemangioma very easily treatable with propranolol 2 mg per kg body weight given for 6 to 8 weeks is very effective but when a patient does not respond in 6 weeks time that is a ground for referral because the patient may not have capillary hemangioma it may be a arteriovenous malformation you might have misdiagnosed it or it is the non responsive variant which will need additional form of treatment such as intralational trimethylon to which it responds beautifully now propranolol did not work much intravenous intralesional trimethylon as tonight 6 weeks later lesion is gone so your amblyopia treatment would become much rapid now it looks like infection this patient has received antibiotics for several weeks with no response now infection without any symptoms this patient has absolutely no pain she has a skin ulcer so what looks like infection that, that does not respond to antibiotics and has necrotic patches on the skin and induration could be a t cell lymphoma so any presumed infection not respond to standard treatment again warrants referral now this child came with bilateral eyelid swelling which was thought to be allergic inflammatory and this child was given steroids for several weeks the moment we start stopped steroids on a friday evening that's when he had come by monday morning his condition has worsened so this was definitely not inflammatory this was an infiltrative lesion here was a case of leukemia now if you have two similar cases two eyelid eyelid swelling patient with eyelid swelling how to look uh, differentiate infl infiltrative versus inflammatory just look at the eyelid crease eyelid crease becomes prominent if it is infiltrative because infiltrative lesions are typically above the level of the tarsus eyelid crease remains normal or becomes prominent whereas inflammatory does not have any boundary it affects the pretarsal skin as well and that causes obliteration of the lid crease so that's one of the differentiating points this is a patient of xanthogranuloma again you see very prominent eyelid crease and patients with xanthogranuloma adult onset xanthogranuloma can have systemic connotations and they need referral now coming to ocular just stop me whenever my whenever my time ends because you know yeah this is a patient with conjunctival pigmentation go back and look at your grandparents or yourselves for that matter very carefully you will have some pigmentation asian indians are bound to have conjunctival pigmentation as long as it is bilateral symmetrical has this cobblestone kind of an appearance and fine pigmentation even of peripheral cornea nothing to worry about as long as it is symmetrical but the moment there is asymmetry like this that is something to worry about this patient has some pigmentation even in the left eye very subtle but the right eye pigmentation is dramatic whenever there is asymmetry you have to rule out primary acquired melanosis which is a pre malignant condition if it is not cobblestone but papery away from the limbus or if it is present in the phonics like this you should rule out primary acquired melanosis and you can see a phonicial pam and a prompt melanoma primary acquired melanosis contributes to 75% of conjunctival melanoma and you should be very aware of this condition now these are are four youngsters who have a pigmented conjunctival lesion all of these are neva if you have any doubt at all you can go through this mental checklist interpalpebral location variable pigmentation right from tan brown to dark chocolate brown no corneal epithelial invasion stops right at the limbus no episcleral fixity absence of intrinsic vascularity but a vida vessel may still be present all these are indicators of a nevus nevi also have microcysts nevi are like sponges and microcysts and macrocysts can be picked up on anterior segment imaging ubm and asoct are very useful and when a nevus turns into a melanoma that is a ground for referral what happens when a nevus turns into melanoma it acquires additional intrinsic vascularity it acquires lot of blood vessels from all layers 
scleral, episcleral, conjunctival, all blood vessels come to feed this hungry tumor and there is solidity of the lesion. It loses its cyst. So this is always, was always a nevus and from this has arisen a melanoma. Now this is a patient again who had a nevus always and from there started a melanoma and this is a clear cut case of melanoma. So melanoma is supposed to be nodular, fleshy with lot of blood supply which is coming at all levels and lot of intrinsic vascularity as well and breaching the limbal barrier. So that's again a ground for effort. Now, if you have patients who have a perilimbal lesion, sometimes patients are operated as pterygium and that turns out, to, turns out to be squamous cell carcinoma. Pterygium actually has desmoplastic activity. These blood vessels are dragged towards the lesion. If this is the apex of the pterygium, then all the blood vessels are coming towards it. Whereas in uh, OSS and ocular surface squamous neoplasia, that doesn't happen. Blood vessels are gently drawn towards the lesion. They're more prominent and the lesion has keratin. So if a lesion were to have keratin, abnormal vascularity like this, corkscrew appearance of blood vessels, keratin, abnormal vascularity, and staining with rose bengal for 97% sensitive and 98% specific to the diagnosis of OSSN. So if a conjunctival lesion looks like pterygium or pengicula, but has abnormal vascularity, stains with rose bengal, and has specks of keratin, you should treat it like OSS. And if you have any doubt at all, you can do anterior segment OCT, where a grayish normal corneal epithelium transforms into hyperreflective hyperplastic epithelium and ends with an abrupt snout that is diagnostic of OSS. Now, in intraocular tumors, if you have a patient with unilateral shallow anterior chamber with a bump, irregular depth of anterior chamber, you must do imaging. Imaging is mandatory to know whether it is a cystic lesion, which is nothing but an innocuous cyst, or a solid lesion, which could be a melanoma or a melanocytoma. Just looking at this will not tell you whether it is a solid or a cystic lesion. So imaging is mandatory. And if you have a patient with unilateral glaucoma in young individual, then pupil is the key. Unilateral glaucoma with a lot of pigmentation, pupil nice, round and central, no NVI, no correctopia, ectopia, nuvia clear-cut melanocytoma, whereas this patient was operated for trabeculectomy, where the pupil has corectopia and ectopia and behind the PI, you see a black mass. This is a patient with melanoma. And when we enucleated, you find that the scleral flap already contains tumor and the bleb also has a tumor. So his intraocular tumor has been made extraocular by missing the diagnosis. Sentinel vessel is a serious business because sentinel vessel can be uh, an indicator of a ciliary body melanoma. Ciliary body melanomas are often hidden and unless you look at the patient with extreme uh, you know, uh, deviation of the eye with the slit lamp uh, angulated in extremely opposite direction, with pupil fully dilated, you may even miss this subtle elevation that is showing through. This is a patient with cataract with a sentinel blood vessel and the cataract surgeon has promptly done a B scan to detect that ciliary body melanoma. So if there is a single sentinel vessel, you should be worried about it. The VVITs and hypopion in an extreme age. This is an elderly individual with what looks like granulomatous VVITs. This is the uh, imaging which shows thickened iris with nodules. This was a case of tapioca melanoma. This is a young individual with re recent change in bowel habits with alternating constipation and diarrhea. With a lot of iris nodules, looks like granulomatous uveitis, yellow hypopion. This was adenoma, adenocarcinoma of the colon metastasizing into the eye. Young, uh, elderly individual with a white hypopion, absolutely white eye. So white-eyed hypopion is diagnostic of either lymphoma or leukemia. This is again a patient with white-eyed hypopion. So in an elderly individual, white-eyed hypopion is diagnostic of lymphoma or leukemia. Whereas in a child, it could be retinoblastoma, as you see here, or even medulloepithelioma, which has much larger block, balls of cells, which look like pseudohypopia. The vitreous haze can hide a lot. This is not a case of vitritis, because under the haze, you see yellowish placoid lesions in the retina, which is very obvious in this patient, sub-RP and RP infiltrates. This is retinovitreal lymphoma. So any intraocular tumor is worth a referral. This is a patient with 
lymphoma. This is a patient with multifocal bilateral metastasis, creamy white lesions. In fact, this patient did not give a history of systemic condition at all. He came with loss of vision and only on further evaluation was he found to have small cell carcinoma of the lung. Any patient with metamorphopsia, etc., may actually look like sometimes CSR, but you should always look for a subtle pink lesion that is choroidal hemangioma, which will need treatment. A pigmented lesion with a lot, lot of brucin on top is generally a nevus, whereas this is a melanoma. And if you have something in between, doesn't look like a nevus, doesn't look like a melanoma yet, small two millimeter size lesion, this patient refused treatment and it has promptly grown in six months time. So this was actually a melanoma. So if you have a, a diagnostic dilemma at all, look at thickness, thickness more than two millimeter, subretinal fluid, presence of symptoms such as loss of vision, presence of orange pigment or lipofuscin, margin very close to the optic dyskinphobia and following on ultrasound, halo because of RPE loss and absence of drusen. These are all the signs that will indicate that this is actually a case of melanoma. Most intraocular tumors need a referral. And if a child were to come to you with leukoporia, never take it light. Leukoporia can be because of cataract, I agree. But if it is something behind the lens, that would need referral. Even if you think it is PHPV, etc., you should definitely refer these patients. Squint is a sign of retinoblastoma in a quarter of patients. If a child were to come to you with squint, never leave the child without complete dilatation and look at the, looking at the fundus. These are some of the simulating lesions looking like congenital glaucoma, thysis bulbi, hyphema with even an evidence of lid injury. All these have retinoblastoma. So leukocoria and squint in children need evaluation. In proptosis, I would say every patient with proptosis need not be referred. This is a patient with exophthalmus. So you should learn to evaluate exophthalmus, thyroid exophthalmus based on scoring system. And if a patient has active disease, that would need treatment. Patients who have disease like this or diplopia or severe proptosis, exophthalmus with inflammation, these are active thyroid disease that need treatment. And any patient with proptosis with a tumor lying behind definitely would warrant a referral. So this is what I could cover in the short time. Uh, I, I know you gave me long enough time, but the spectrum is so large that I could only cover about 50-60% of the common ones. So if you remember some of these, then you can go back and remember who is good, who is bad, and who is ugly. Thank you so much. That was Thank you so much. Yeah, that was absolutely wonderful. As I mentioned, Rohit, a walking, talking encyclopedia and a textbook in his own right. I have every time keep learning from whatever he has presented and look at the cases, the plethora of cases. This collection, you can't have that easily. It, it is a lifetime collection, lifetime achievement award. Fantastic. I mean, brilliant cases. And as I said, in one sitting, you can't go through what he has said. You need multiple sittings to go through what exactly he's trying to be saying and, and what exactly he meant. So the question, one of the question is uh, anything which is abnormal and you rightly said that we cannot treat it on our own. It should be referred immediately. Uh, absolutely. But how to break the news to relatives is one question that, you know, an ophthalmologist is not used to. An onco surgeon is used to that. But to break the heartbreaking news of a retinoblastoma to a parent is really heartbreaking to anybody. How, how would you like to do that? How should you be doing that? Well, it should be very gentle because retinoblastoma is curable currently with more than 98% life salvage. Even in advanced situations, it can be cured. Eye can be saved and vision can, can be saved as well. So you should give that good news that, well, your child has an eye cancer, but we can definitely save his life, eye and vision. So you would need referral. And that is the starting point. Of course, when they meet an ocular oncologist, they'll be given further details about it and the news will slowly sink in. But they should not go with a false sense of security that uh, you know it is something innocuous or they should not be so scared that they would refuse to go to uh, you know, oncologist or whatever. Um, can I bring in Dr. Gaurav here, uh, the chairman ERC of IRSI. Good evening, sir. Hi, Rohan, and uh, good evening, everyone. I'm sorry I joined late, Dr. Santosh, but I enjoyed the last 12, 13 minutes that I could catch. Uh, as always, I mean, you know, it's like spellbound with, uh, I mean, uh, you, the way you convey your message, and uh, I really enjoyed it again. I've heard you so many times, but each time I get to learn something new. So so I think uh, you covered it up so well, and as I would understand, you know, you would have, if we had given you an hour to speak, 
I think you would have still, you know, kind of needed more time still to complete, you know, something, and we would have all been spellbound for that whole hour. Anyway, uh, I think uh, for our young people, the message is very clear. What uh, Dr. Santosh said, and what I could, you know, the part that I could catch that, uh, you know, when to when to refer and when to kind of how to suspect and how to kind of uh, follow up. I think more than me, I think we should have our young younger people and the other. Uh, faculty put in their uh, thoughts and questions because that they will definitely have better things to ask than me so i'll i'll pass it on to our younger people one one question i i had sir uh, which was that is there any primary investigation that should be done by a general ophthalmologist before referring the patient for uh, eyelid lesions well investigations may not be required because some of these are very specialized like we might want to do a head and neck pet scan things like that depending on what lesion is it is uh, for ocular surface lesions anterior segment oct is very useful so if you have it you can as well do it but do all along the lesion not at one point of the lesion if you do a raster scan with the entire lesion scan that will be very useful rather than doing a single point asoct for orbital tumors i think if you have already diagnosed a tumor that means that you have already done some form of imaging it is not uh, going to be much help to the patient if you uh, you know have already done a ct scan to get a mri scan also done before the patient consults a oculoplasty specialist or an oncologist because they might have certain specifications in mind as to how they want the mri scan done for example diffusion weighted images etc so whatever protocols they have let them use that rather than you know getting it done and having to repeat it later Right. Is there any time frame that someone should you know send refer a patient or should you know wait for a couple of months and then send it? Couple of months is not ideal. Within a few weeks, but a child with retinoblastoma, of course, mm -hmm. would need referral the same week. If anybody is losing vision because of a tumor that is pressing on the optic nerve with uh, compression optic neuropathy or thyroid disease with compression optic neuropathy, there are emergencies. as long as vision is not at stake and the tumor has been growing very slowly they can wait for a few weeks before they can reach an ocular oncologist or an oculoplasty surgeon what well, about the lesions on the lid margins and you know otherwise uh, would you be doing like an fnsc should you be taking a small biopsy and send it for histopathology before sending it uh, well if you are thinking of malignant lesion it is ideal not to do a biopsy because we when we do a uh, excision of these eyelid lesions we completely excise these not do a small biopsy unless a destructive surgery is required if a lesion is very extensive and if you think that excentration may be the treatment of choice for medical legal purposes and to be sure to have that kind of a you know um, uh, what do you call so patient has to be conveyed the news that the patient will need a destructive surgery to have that confidence you might want to do an incisional biopsy but if the diagnosis is obvious then you never want to do an incisional biopsy and disturb the lesion a uh, dictum is that if a cat looks like a cat it is a cat <laughs> right so you don't want to kind of do a genetic testing on a cat to say it is a cat so think in ocular oncology it's so interesting because everything is visible and is seen this is the only field of medicine except dermatology where everything is seen right so it's very interesting except orbital tumors of course which still uh, are sometimes difficult to diagnose if i may bring in dr akshay once uh, sir one question uh, is that if there is misdiagnosis like if a patient comes to you and he has been misdiagnosed earlier then then what is the way to counsel that patient like it's not just that patient comes to you at a tertiary center sometimes a lot of misdiagnosed patients come to us at secondary centers as well so how do you go about counseling these patients well we just tell them that your doctor has done his best and now that you have come here and our additional tests show that uh, this is slightly different and then we take it from there never ever say anything bad or wrong about the you know primary doctor he would not have misdiagnosed it because of his intention to misdiagnose it he probably has misdiagnosed it because he has not seen such a lesion and it is possible in early practice for many youngsters not to have seen these lesions 
especially if you are done residency in a medical college sometimes they may not have sub specialty reward so much or if you have uh, done a fellowship in say for example in cataract refractive surgery you may not have a, had an occasion to even in say institutes you may not have had an occasion to see uh, oculoplasty and oncology spectrum so it's always possible that you may not have seen it so it is okay to misdiagnose it and learn Frank, admission, Rohan. Frank, admission, Rohan. Uh, I wouldn't have seen 10 to 15 percent in my lifetime, also, of what he has shown, and that is a genuine admission of what I'm saying. What do you say, Gaurav? Completely agree because you know when you get into. I think um, you know when I was doing my MS in uh, Mamsi, I would have seen a lot of things which I could did not recognize because. you know as a resident you will not kind of unless somebody is giving you structured teaching and you know you have you have a consultant available every time to be able to consult each time so you'll miss so many things so i learned with them the hard way but subsequently once you get into practice and you know nowadays very few people actually do general ophthalmology practice they would mostly try to specialize either into something or the other and if you get into that you know and you have other consultants in other specialties you will end up not seeing many things which you would see in a general practice so i really miss that part because now i'm mostly doing cataract refractive nothing else comes to me you know either they'll go to the pediatric ophthalmologist or to my cornea consultant or to my you know retina or the uvia people so i'll rarely see ocular tumors but uh, i completely agree with you on that one but good, for example one, one good uh, you know way to learn is to send pictures to somebody who knows about this Absolutely. you know many residents and uh, even uh, fellows of different specialties send me or general ophthalmologists send keep sending pictures on whatsapp these days everything mm-hmm. is uh, accessible to smartphone for photography Absolutely. and you send a picture and uh, if the person to whom you sent the picture opines that it is a tumor and gives the diagnosis then if it is possible for you to manage locally you can with the protocol but if you can't then you can always refer it i agree what? dr santosh in fact today you know you have access to even the regular phones and through the slit lamp it's not difficult i see my uh, daughter anshika uh, you know keep capturing images on the iphone and sending out and you have to have an inquisitive mind so what more important is that when you see something unusual you should not just pass it on that this may be another thing that i don't know you should always have that desire to know what it is and maybe you know try to kind of and we have so many groups now we have so many ways of finding out from you know you can always i, I do that all the time even though i'm doing refractive surgery for 20 years even today when i see an unusual topography map or i see an oct epithelium thickness map which is unusual and i, I want to consult three four of my colleagues i'll just send it out and ask that do you think you know and i do it every day in spite of you know being doing this for so many years so i think we are learning every day from each other and that's you have to have that bent of uh, thought that you are inquisitive enough to you know do this i think go and take a hint and he's open if people send him photographs to give a diagnosis uh, yes. that is so that that's a strong hint that he has given very sweet of him to say that not just not just general ophthalmologists and you know other specialists even his old fellows we also send him photographs when we have cases that uh, we have having different just to brag about his management <laughs> the no. i think just to add to that this is a line that i use very often sometimes patients try to put you in a spot especially when you know there has been a diagnosis and this is something that i learned from dr santosh he always keeps uh, you know he's he's uh, has a poker face and very very calm coolly explains but if prodded and pushed this is a line that he used which i now often use he says your doctor has done the best i am here to give my opinion on your condition not an opinion on someone else's opinion and i think that is very clear because then you know the patients just stop asking which is what we need to do and not bad mouth the referring doctor excuse me sir i wanted to ask something that sir as pgs we encounter so many cases of proptosis and squint and so most of them are referred without any further evaluation so what are some warning signs that can tell us that this is not benign and that is that this is something that requires urgent attention because a lot of these patients they see that they just keep doing the rounds and they never get diagnosed and then eventually they get tired and they leave So, yeah. what are some warning signs to look for in these patients? Well, in a child with squint, you know, the squint squint is mainly caused by visual deprivation in a, in a patient with retinoblastoma, and that is because of a macular tumor or a juxtapapillary tumor with uh, subretinal fluid. So, even if you can just look at the posterior pole without anesthesia, if that is clear, then definitely it is not because of retinoblastoma. Mm-hmm. 
right peripheral retinoblastoma will not cause quint so then you are clear but ideally you should do a full fundus evaluation with indentation to rule out retinoblastoma but if you have seen the posterior pole absolutely you are clear that it is not because of retinoblastoma it could be because of something else no other causes for quint in proptosis anything that is rapidly evolving is something that you should be worried about if a currently you know whenever a patient comes to me ask them to show all the pictures open their mobile and show all the pictures that they can show you know without hesitation all right so if they show a series of pictures and if something was there 10 years ago and very slowly has increased then you are quite sure that it is a benign lesion whereas something that has evolved in 6 months or 9 months and the patient has ocular motility restriction the patient has uh, diplopia or patient has uh, an isochoria patient has disc edema etc either it's either inflammation or a tumor extremes of age group you should be worried about a child with proptosis and somebody beyond 50 60 years of age with proptosis are the ones which fall into the category of tumors whereas everybody in the middle either have inflammation or infection so those are dictums you know but then you can't apply that to every patient you have to individualize thank you sir thank you thank you so much uh, so we'll move on to our next speaker uh, dr akshay nayar so i'll introduce sir it's a pleasure for me to introduce him dr nayar did his dnb in 2009 from sankranetra le chennai followed by a fellowship in oculoplasty surgery and ocular oncology from lvpi hyderabad in 2012 he also completed his ico fellowship in 2015 from new york eye infirmary of mount sinai usa He has hundred plus published, peer-reviewed, indexed papers, and is a reviewer for thirty journals. He has many awards to his name, including the Achievement Award from the American Academy of Ophthalmology in two thousand nineteen. Sir is currently practicing at multiple centers in Mumbai. Welcome to the show, sir. So, sir, uh, since he is traveling, he has uh, sent us. He's been kind enough to send us a pre-recorded uh, presentation. We'll just have that up, and then we'll uh, have him for discussion after that. Uh, thank you to the IIRSI for this opportunity to speak to you today. Apologies for not being presenting live. Uh, the time zones are a little difficult to work out. Uh, I'm currently in oculoplastic private practice in Mumbai, and I'll be speaking on uh, the hurdles and how to overcome them while setting up an oculoplastic practice. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here on this platform alongside. Uh, Dr. Santosh Onawar, with whom I trained in oculoplastics and oncology at L. V. Prasad Institute, uh, that is what I practice exclusively. I am affiliated to a group practice as well as a group corporate chain of eye hospitals. This talk is basically from a lot of personal experience, meant for training of thermologists or oculoplastic surgeons who are in fellowship or about to complete their fellowship, and are deciding about what to do ahead. So, what are the options that you have once you've finished your fellowship or uh, you know associateship in oculoplastics? One is to stay back in the hospital you trained, to join a established practice uh, or a chain as an associate. There are a lot of single center, uh, single practitioner centers which have grown up in scale and volume in a lot of big cities, where uh, there is always a position for a specialist to join in, and they can be a great option in the big move. another option is to build your own solo private practice to freelance as a visiting oculoplastic surgeon to join a government organization or a trust or a non government organization or non for profit hospital or as to join as a full time consultant in a corporate hospital or an institute and now i'll be talking about each of these in a advantages disadvantage pros and cons uh, type of uh, you know pattern so that you get uh, an idea of both sides of the coin So once you finish your training in a large hospital in a teaching institute, staying back there for a certain period is a great option. Uh, of course, you need to align whether you want to do it for a short term or for the long term. It, it allows you to gain experience and do further specialization. Say, for example, you want to do endoscopic lacrimal surgeries. A training hospital gives you that opportunity to do that. It gives you some time to figure out what you may eventually want to do after this. 
The advantages is that you are in a familiar environment. You are immediately back into the game of operating. Only thing with an additional extra income because now you are a faculty member there, and a training hospital always serves as a great platform for you to fulfill all your academic inclinations. You know, conduct studies, present, publish, etc. What about joining a practice or a hospital uh, as an associate? Uh, when you've come in just out of training, there's a possibility that you would be taken in as a junior associate, even though you see only oculoplastics or a subspeciality. There are great many advantages. You get to see and learn how a successful practice works. Eventually, when you want to set up a fellowship, a, a, a practice of your own, I call this period as a super fellowship because you see exactly what you have to do and what not to do when you set up a practice of your own. Uh, when you go into this practice, because it's already well established, the number of patients and the surgeries that you see are more or less assured. There is a good uh, remuneration with a fixed income that comes your way, and you don't have to worry about other things like you know maintenance of instruments, staff, quality assurance, etc. These things are taken care of by the hospital. But there are a lot of disadvantages as well. At the end of the day, you're working for someone. You may have targets, and your working hours are fixed and sometimes long. Uh, creating your own identity may, be, identity may be difficult because you're one among many there. And at the end of the day, there's always a ceiling to your earnings when you stay as an associate in a previously established practice that belongs to someone else. The other option is building your own solo practice. Now, this is something that is, you know, a lot of people consider early in practice. And when I say solo practice, it means creating a standalone practice, consulting with or without an operating room where the patient comes directly to you as, as, as you may be their primary treating ophthalmologist. It gives you a lot of advantages. You have the complete freedom to choose how you practice, where you practice, and what type of patients you see. So basically what your practice is going to be about. It's, it's, it's you are your own boss. Uh, it, it is extremely challenging, but is also more rewarding because you have significantly higher earnings compared to working for someone or under someone. But at the same time, there are disadvantages. It is extremely investment heavy. Real estate, equipment, staff, overheads, all of them add on to your expenses. There's always going to be an initial incubation period where it takes a time for your earnings graph and the busy, the, the amount of patients that you see they, for that graph to go up and reach a peak or plateau. Uh, it may be difficult to restrict your private practice only to oculoplastics because you are going to be reliant on a lot of reference for specialty practice. Uh, visiting conferences or meetings means your practice is shut, which means your income is not going to be increasing in those days. So these opportunities are few. And there is no one to help you uh, in your complications. You end up learning from your own mistakes because there is no backups. So you are extremely, you will have to be extremely careful. Like I said, this is extremely challenging right from choosing where to practice, figuring out who, you know, where, what is the best location that will serve your purpose well. The competition around raising the resources for finances and equipment are challenges that need to, we need to figure out on our own. Also, what is the right time to go into solo private practice? A lot of us prefer to stay with institutes for a long time get some income, have a backup, and then go into solo practice. So we need to figure the right time on our own. For some, it may be too late. You know, getting into private practice in your 40s or 50s can be a little difficult decision. Uh, because at the end of the day, this is a permanent or a long-term change, which you may not have the opportunity to go back on. It requires a, an incubation period, like I mentioned in the beginning, through which you have to fight through with commitment and patience. And uh, you may also have to do general ophthalmology and cat tech, which is not, of course, a bad thing, because if you're good at it, why not? Because that augments your practice. Only thing we need to be cognizant about is that if you're also doing general ophthalm and cat tech and refractive, in addition to oculoplastics, your reference for your specialty or your oculoplastic, oculoplastic practice may reduce. How about freelancing? Freelancing basically means you offer your services as a specialist to different centers. These could be multiple centers in different parts of the city or even different parts of the country where you can visit, say, once a month, once in two months. Uh, this could be your only source of practice or it could be in addition to your regular hospital attachment as well. The advantages is that when you go to visit someone else's clinic to operate only for a particular case, building that practice and getting more patients there is not your responsibility. You go there and you start operating from day one. 
you have the flexibility of choosing when to practice, how to operate, et cetera, and it can be rewarding. But everybody wants flexibility, the referring doctor, the patient there. So someone's schedule has to give way. And more often than not, it's the person who's freelancing. Uh, you don't want to visit too many centers and spread yourself too thin so that you don't have time for yourself. And in these scenarios, you don't always see what you're trained for. I've been called to operate on squint surge, squint patients, and I've had to politely tell the doctor that you know squints and oculoplastics are different. Remember, in these places, there was always someone else before you. So now that you go there, once you stop going there, there's going to be someone else who's coming after you. So a freelance surgeon is always replaceable. A following up on patients is, is can be an advantage or a disadvantage, whichever way you see it. And in oculoplastics, you know, oftentimes you have to carry your own instruments, your pottery machine, your consumables, sutures, etc., which over time can take a toll on you. So in freelancing, how do you break into the scene? I, I call it the ABC of private practice, availability, behavior, and competence. You need to be available because oftentimes you get called on the day that the surgeon wants you to operate. So you need to be available to be, uh, you know, to go and do that. Uh, we need to be very, very uh, respectful in our behavior. Oftentimes, people from large training institute can have a chip on their shoulder, which can rub people the wrong way. Uh, so we need to be very, very cognizant of that. And competence. At the end of the day, if you're able to deliver good results, there is no reason why you won't be called upon again and again to operate. So freelancing is a balancing act. It gives you the flexibility, but remember, you're replaceable. It's not always sustainable everywhere, every time. So you may have to cut down on the places you go to freelance. You really don't have a sense of belonging to the practice or the ownership over patients because you're visiting someone else's center for a temporary period. At the end of the day, good results is what brings good relationships with surgeons and practices. The next option is a government or, or a, a trust hospital. I do not recommend this as a long-term attachment for a specialist. In the short term, in the beginning of your practice, this can be good. Or later on, in addition to your main practice, this can be a center where you can go and treat unaffording patients. This could be you know, even out of town where you go on a fixed schedule sometime in a month or once in two months, et cetera. So once you've finished your fellowship, you know, you're you, you're back and then you often scratch your head thinking, what now? So first thing you do is take a break. You've just finished a, you know, a, a, a stressful period of training. Take a break, do nothing and work on your visibility after that. Get a business card or a brochure printed. For us, thankfully, in oculoplastics, this is such a visual branch. You can have pictures of a before and after of process of an eyelid tumor, of a patient who with you know, thyroid eye disease that you've treated. And these photos speak much more than a large paragraph on what you can do or what you cannot do. And the same thing can go on a website. I believe creating your own website is extremely important because 10, 15 years down the line, patients are going to look themselves, look uh, uh, for these things online and refer themselves to you rather than coming through a referring ophthalmologist or a referring colleague. Building your pre online presence, therefore, is very important early in your career itself. Think about meeting local ophthalmologists because going and meeting local ophthalmologists is extremely key. They are going to be the ones referring patients to you. Go and meet local specialists, local oculoplastic surgeons to figure out how they did their practice. Uh, you know, if you need help in a difficult case or some equipment, go ask them. Meet your alumni. If you're trained from an institute, there are chances that, you know, there are people from your same speciality, from the same institute, who set up practice in the same city. Figure out what they did, what was their story, and how you can learn from their mistakes. Go and meet the local ophthalmologist again, because recall is important to let them you know that you're available, and you don't need to be dissuaded by the things that they may say. Ten years ago, I was told that you can never practice only oculoplastics in a city like Mumbai. And go again and meet them because that's the only way they'll remember you when they have a case that requires your help. Uh, participate in local meets in your city, in your state. Uh, speak to the scientific committee coordinator, volunteer to present because the guys whom you met three times earlier will be the people who will see you present and that will ring a bell for them. Even if you're not presenting, attend them so that you can network at these places. National and international meets can wait for later on. Fees. Now, this is something that we should all have been taught during medical college and in fellowship training, but we are not. Things that we need to be very clear and upfront about is how much we charge per patient, 
and how much you would charge as a surgeon. Be honest, be clear and transparent about this wherever and whenever you go to operate. Do not undersell yourself. You're killing yourself. And if you are honest and clear about these things, this will be the foundation for long-term associations because everybody likes transparency. If you don't know how much to charge or what is what is the right amount, speak to colleagues, speak to other oculoplastic surgeons in the city or in the country to figure out what you need to do. Be ethical when you start out. Don't operate when you don't want to or you're unsure about just because someone wants you to do a case because your best advertisement is going to be a happy patient and conversely, an unsatisfied patient is your worst nightmare. Go surgeons where you go and operate on behalf of someone without the patient really knowing is, is something that is an actual practice that happens. Personally, I'm not comfortable with it, with it, but you need to figure out internally if you're okay with it in the beginning of your career, that is a bitter pill that some of us may have to swallow. Uh, my own personal story was that I have no family background in ophthalmology. So when I came back to Bombay from my training in Hyderabad at LVP, I went about meeting colleagues, local ophthalmologists. The most important thing that worked in my favor was meeting alumni. Three of my primary attachments, which is uh, the three that you see here, are all founded by alumni from Shankar Netrale and LV Prasad, where I trained and where now I have had the opportunity to build my practice. Uh, I also am attached to a medical college where I'm able to satisfy my academic urges of, you know, studies, papers, uh, publications and presentations, and also serve as a guide for thesis for students. Freelancing is, is something that, you know, I was heavily reliant upon earlier, but now over the years, I've cut down from visiting to many centers down to just two centers. Setting up my own website was the single uh, imp most important decision that I made because over 40% of the patients that I now treat are directly come to me through my own website with my eventual goal to have a single center practice down the line. So to summarize, Think about what you want to do. There can be many hurdles and you need to overcome them, but you need to take all stakeholders' decisions involved, uh, your family, your mentors, your friends, and align your long-term and short-term plans. If you want to go abroad uh, in the near future, then you should not be sitting in a, in a government hospital here doing something that may not necessarily add value to what you want to do later on. Be persistent. Patience is extremely important. And don't forget to have fun. Our country has 1.3 billion people, which basically means 1.3 billion patients. So the whole concept of an unsuccessful ophthalmologist in India, it doesn't exist. So uh, don't put too much pressure on yourself and enjoy what you do. Uh, I love this quote. The best way to predict the future is to go ahead and create it. Thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Akshay, sir. If you're there, one question. So when we had the retina session, uh, we had Dr. Lalit Verma on the panel. And uh, this freelancing thing came up back then also. And he was completely against it. He said what happens in freelancing is that your name, the thing you mentioned in your presentation about ghost surgeries, your name will never come up. When you go to someone else's practice and you operate over there, that person's name will only be known to the patients. What's your take on that? Yeah, I think it's, like I said, it's, you know, it's something that we need to figure out in the beginning part of your career. You, uh, you, you know, you need to do something. You can't be sitting at home or just seeing patients without operating. So that may be a possibility. But I think now, you know, surgeons everywhere are, you know, very mindful and understanding of the fact that special, specialists are, are people who are needed. And there is no point in doing uh, or taking credit for some surgery or being, you know, the surgeon on paper and having a ghost surgeon specialist come and operate for you. All you need is a failed DCR for that, uh, uh, you know, the main referring doctor to uh, have their brains chewed up by a patient and then they will realize that, you know, it's not something that they want to have. So I, I think this used to happen earlier, but it, I, it's changing and uh, people are very, very respectful of, you know, the skill sets that you bring, whether it's a retina surgeon, a squint surgeon or an oculoplastic surgeon. And uh, that is changing. So I, that, I would feel that it is not as much as a problem as it used to be. Uh, I'd like to hear Dr. Santosh's thoughts on that. Because he's, he's had, he's trained at a government hospital, gone abroad, been in an institute, and now set up, you know, being a part of a chain of hospitals. So he's, he's had slices of every pie. 
I, I don't think ghost surgery is uh, no longer a problem. I don't think it's a problem at all because I think every surgeon who operates in other set, setups now, at least oculoplasty, as far as I know, are uh, recognized. In fact, they insist that they see the patient preoperatively and postoperatively, without which I don't think you should be doing any surgery. Maybe um, exception being cataract, you know, even that is not an exception, honestly, but uh, oculoplasty, you preoperative evaluation is mandatory. So I don't think ghost surgeries are happening in oculoplasty, not to my knowledge at least. There are a few ghost cataract surgeons also, by the way, Rohan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's part of there, the normal there, industry. There, there are also a lot of ghost Patients who come and haunt us when the surgery hasn't gone as well as it should have. But yeah, I think, uh, like, I agree with sir. I, I, I don't remember in the past 10, 9 years since I've started practice, bearing a couple of cases way back in the beginning of my practice that I've been asked to do go surgery. So I, I agree with sir. that it, It's difficult because you have to evaluate the ptosis. You have to evaluate, uh, you know, proptosis before you go in and put a knife on the patient. So... I think uh, another thing that we could probably focus on more and uh, something we can learn from Dr. Akshay is uh, definitely how he documents his cases for social media. Um, so when I started out um, uh, with definitely uh, one of the big names in oculoplasty, um, I was wondering how do I create my uh, niche or how do people get to know me? So um, I went through Dr. Akshay's website uh, and of course his Instagram page and Facebook page and everything. And I sort of have emulated him in some way uh, in setting up my own page and uh, the way I go about things, the way he watermarks things. And, you know, he's uh, quite thorough with his um, social media. So uh, being young people and uh, the youthful uh, people who are coming into practice these days, there's a lot to learn from him and if we start off early, I think it's it will be very advantageous for us. I just saw the website, sir. It's actually very, very nice. It's inspiring us to make a website for our own self and you know have it in such a way. It's really nice. It's a nice website. I think every every doctor should because people there is I don't think any you know in, in large in cities and urban centers, every patient who uh, is going to get operated almost always Googles their doctor's name once. So if there is, you know, some reference or some standpoint available for patients to see what, who is this person? What have they done? Has he operated cases like mine? And what is the before and after? That convinces them up to a large extent. And then they know, okay, this guy knows what he's doing. And uh, in spite of that, of course, you know, you always have patients who will come and ask how many such surgeries have you done? or where you train from and all of this. And you have, you know, I think all of that is part of the game, but a website definitely helps. It answers all the, at least half the questions that the patient may otherwise ask you in the clinic and reduces your chair time. Yes. And what about, what about, uh, sir, practicing as at multiple centers, like for in Mumbai, of course, uh, practicing at multiple centers. So how do you go about dividing it? Do you divide it day-wise or do you divide it, do you go to all centers every day? For someone young and dynamic, I mean, how, 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 what is the correct way to go about it? Yeah, so I, I, uh, I have now, of course, it, you know, it has ended up being a very lucky for me because initially I used to go to different days on at different centers. Apologies for the announcement. I may be a little, uh, my voice may be drowned over. Uh, so different centers on different days, do not spread yourself too thin. Don't, you know, I made it a point not to go to more than two hospitals on the same day. Of course, over the past 10 years, what has worked for me is now all three hospitals have been taken over by the same group of hospitals. So now I have good patient portability. I can actually call one patient to another center without worrying about, you know, uh, having a, one hospital's patient in the other. But yeah, the compartmentalized patients, compartmentalized centers, uh, patients are going to be smart. They'll go and find out, uh, you know, uh, they may even call up the hospital and find out their charges and probably go to a place where even marginally lower charges are. So these things are all, you know, you take it with a pinch of salt. But yeah, from your personal aspect, try not to, you know, burn yourself out too early. Burnout is a real thing. It happens. 
and we need to be cognizant of that every saturday or sunday is not a cme or a conference day it's okay to take time off over a weekend and do nothing and sit at home with family great about akshay is that he has clones he is present at multiple centers at the same time i should tell my wife that i have multiple clones of my right so we'll move to the next presentation dr ritwija dr anshika if you can introduce her yes thank you sir um so dr ritwija is has done her pg from uh, st john medical college and uh, bangalore and holds a university rank in ophthalmology she has received the prestigious bear grant under the prestigious global ophthalmology awards program she completed her post graduation and fellowship in oculoplasty and ocular oncology from nn and is currently a consultant at the vision eye center new delhi we welcome you ma'am i thank you so much uh, rohan and pooja for inviting me and of course it's a great honor uh to be included in this along with dr santosh and dr akshay so uh, mine is a little lighter topic and it's directed towards people who have uh, just finished their um post graduation so um i hope you will uh, gain something and figure out um, about various oculoplasty fellowships uh, and what goes on uh, today so um there are many uh, books which talk about success but uh, there's nothing which uh will help you more than all the mistakes you make during your fellowship so i think that's uh, what taught me the most and of course uh, oculoplastics is not just uh, doing dcrs uh, it is about eyelid surgery orbit uh, oncology and now uh, up and coming is oculofacial aesthetics uh so before starting a fellowship it's very important to have a uh, basic skills like suturing techniques so uh, tissue handling is something which we should know uh, well before a fellowship uh, so that you can make uh, the best use of your fellowship and uh, as uh, dr santosh mentioned the good bad and the ugly so the fellowship uh, basically teaches you uh, how to differentiate things and that's why you will get reference for this in future so uh, most importantly in the fellowship is learning from your senior so uh, your hod or your consultant may not always have time in the opd or ot to ex explain uh, various soft skills so uh, it's important to learn how to uh, describe an mri or pick up lesions on a ct scan and these things can be best learned from your colleagues and of course uh, the transition from the old to the new so earlier people would operate uh, their naked eye or uh, try to use an operating microscope so uh, what happens is uh, now we have loops uh, which uh, al allow better visibility and mobility for the surgeon uh, along with that uh, endoscopic dcr is taught in places like uh, lb prasad Uh, but uh, more than that even if it's not there in your center it's very important to know how to use an endoscope and how to wield an endoscope so uh, these are things which people are picking up these days in their fellowship so you start with uh, learning how to assist so you learn from the uh, assistants who've been there for several years so how to assist is extremely important and then you go on to operate under supervision from your consultant and then uh, you go on to teach others so uh, this is pro probably the longest curve so you uh, take a lot of time to learn various things you pick it up from various places and then eventually finally you get to teach others so what you learn most in the fellowship is how to do things the right way whether it is uh, photography clinical photography for a patient or whether it is doing cryotherapy for an ossn or even uh, mounting specimens for histopathology doing things the right way is extremely important and this is one of the main things that you learn in your fellowship um with respect to oncology not very many places offer it but definitely uh, people who have trained with dr santosh and uh, others they've all all gone on to uh, practice oncology uh, in their setups as well so uh, it's important uh, to sort of know whether you want to learn it or not what you need uh, for your practice in future and uh, seeing all these things and getting exposed to these things uh, even if you are not primarily doing that it helps you to sort of pick up things uh, sort of diagnose things correctly and then go on to do the best management for the patient uh, aesthetics is something which uh, it's not there everywhere but definitely we did get to see some of it at nn and i know dr kasturi does it 
at uh, Shankar Dev Nitralaya. So uh, this is something which a lot of patients ask for these days, especially if you're in private practice. So uh, getting uh, a good hang of this is, uh, it, there's a long learning curve even for this, but uh, it's good to uh, get an idea, a fair idea of it with respect to counseling patients and uh, about uh, definitely injection techniques, etc. Along with this, a fellowship gives you academic opportunities like uh, cadaver dissection. So this is where you can really brush up your anatomy well and uh, conducting ICs and uh, sort of being able to uh, network. So this is very important uh, to participate in, especially when you're in fellowship. So it's important to take initiative and uh, go for these things. So uh, you can showcase your talent. So a lot of people are doing these uh, things these days. And of course, publishing. So take all the time that you have in your fellowship because you're never gonna get it back uh, to sort of uh, you know go ahead and publish things uh, look up case reports, uh, look up the literature, see how rare it is and go ahead and publish. So there's no greater joy than you can see uh, of us completing an Excel sheet uh, in fellowship. So um, it's important to work hard at this time so that uh, you have a good start. And of course, uh, the COVID pandemic uh, made us study, uh, you know, aerosolization with, with oculoplastic surgeries at IISC. Uh, in Bangalore and of course people who have borne the brunt of mucormycosis. So uh, various opportunities are unexpected and they come around uh, once in a while during fellowship. So uh, that's enough about um, what I think. Uh, I really wanted to get an opinion uh, from various people who have just sort of finished their fellowship and gone into practice from across the country and uh, what they feel and what uh, they think. So uh, this is Dr. Sushma who did her fellowship um, at Giridharai Institute uh, with Dr. Marian Pauli. So she felt that uh, including postings with allied specialties, such as neuro-ophthalmology and uh, outside of ophthalm, maxillofacial surgery, uh, pathology are a good part of fellowship training. And she enjoyed the variety of cases which uh, they had. And uh, Dr. Shilpa did her fellowship at Arvind um, under uh, Dr. Usha Kim. So she uh, said that doing a fellowship itself uh, is a um, privilege in itself. So uh, she's very happy with her fellowship. Uh, then Dr. Anju, she did uh, her fellowship uh, at Shankar Netralia with Dr. Bipasha. Uh, and she felt that there was an adequate exposure to complicated cases, but it's also important uh, to focus on the less common conditions that form the bulk of your daily practice. Uh, Dr. Parvati did her fellowship at Narayan Netrali in Bangalore, and she is now uh, practicing in Mysore. Uh, she's the only one there. So uh, she says that managing trauma is something which is very important uh, to have exposure to during fellowship. And she would have also liked if she had learned endonasal DCR and aesthetics. So uh, she uh, enjoyed her fellowship in terms of learning how to uh, have good clinical judgment and decision making skills. Uh, Dr. Priyanka did her fellowship at LV Prasad, and she felt that uh, it is important to learn with each and every case, uh, but also that people should know about oculoplastic surgeons because people don't really know who they should refer certain things to. So it's important to sort of uh, put ourselves out there and have a wider reach. Uh, Dr. Sumit did his fellowship under Dr. Hunabar at CFS, and he felt that it's important to have an independent OPD and OT in the last two months of fellowship. So partially supervised. And uh, they should be given an opportunity to work with a mentor who practices uh, what they want to practice in future, such as oncology or aesthetics. And uh, of course, the exchange program with fellows. So um, Dr. Aditi, uh, who is doing her fellowship now uh, with Dr. Kasturi at uh, Shankar Dev Nitralia, said that uh, it's important to master uh, very uh, niche skills like endoscopic techniques to reach the orbital apex. And she felt the need for standardization of curriculum across the country. So possibly a good overlap uh, with fellowships, which are in institutes and senior residencies. So she felt that a need for fellowship even after three years of senior residency. So that's important to know. Uh, Dr. Samisha again did with uh, Dr. Honabar and she went on to do her um, oncology fellowship with um, Dr. Shields. So she said maybe even neurosurgery is something we should have uh, exposure to since there are several cross referrals. And uh, uh, finally, uh, Dr. Gunjan, uh, who did her fellowship at AIMS, she felt there was good hands on training under supervision, which is what she felt uh, that volume is required to go on and practice in future. Now, uh, we also have 
Dr. Fatima, who uh, finished her fellowship at Narayan Netralia and is now the only oculoplastic surgeon in the whole of Bahrain. So she uh, felt that, uh, yes, uh, networking was something uh, which helped her a lot uh, during fellowship because uh, even now she sort of uh, goes back and forth with her mentors uh, who guide her whenever she's puzzled with a case. So uh, that's a big uh, responsibility for her. But most importantly, I think uh, learning how uh, a team works, good teamwork, working in a good center, as Dr. Akshay said, learning how uh, a good center works. And of course, it's important to have fun as well during fellowship and make friends. So uh, that's something I think we all do. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your patient listening. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rituja. And very innovative and nice of you to, you know, share experiences from the length and breadth of the country. Um, so as you mentioned, I picked on the point of uh, uh, the doctor who did the fellowship from Ames Delhi said about, you know, getting good amount of case load. Um, I would like to ask you and then bring in Dr. Onavar and Dr. Nair into this. In oculoplasty, is it numbers like in cataract they say, in some institutes they say that, you know, it's the numbers that count. In some institutes they say that, you know, doing it the correct way is most important. So what's your take on, on that? Yeah, I think you answered the question yourself. So uh, if you have a good mentor uh, who teaches you things the right way, definitely that's all that you need. A few cases with them, assisting them. or For example, you don't really get to perform an orbital decompression on your own uh, in a fellowship. But if you, uh, you know, participate in all the steps and uh, you sort of get to know each and every uh, type of thing which could possibly come to you, that is uh, what I think is most important. Of course, in AIMS, they do get a variety of everything. Uh, it's just the sheer number of patients which come to them by default. That is that is probably why she enjoyed that the most. And what about uh, Dr. Onawar, sir? Can I, if I may bring you in, uh, what about uh, the point that was made about, you know, doing the regular cases, getting, of course, getting the variety, the cases which are, you know, not very common. But what about the regular cases, being able to do that, which you know makes up 60-70% of the bulk of your OPD? So do you think that in a certain fellowships or when you get into very highly specialized things, you tend to neglect or ignore those regular things? That is actually right. In fact, uh, in a beginning oculoplasty surgeon's platter, there would be lacrimal surgery, lid surgery, and maybe ocular surface. Orbit comes a little later and medical management of thyroid disease. Orbit comes, orbital surgery comes a little later. And trauma, of course. So if they're conversant with all these, then I think they can start off their practice very well. If they're not, then there is something to uh, worry about. You know, you should actually be very good at DCR. You should be able to give more than 95 to 98% success with primary DCRs. You should be able to do intubation. If you have endoscopic DCR skills, that is good. But external DCR is absolutely not bad. If you can't do endoscopic DCR, there should be no underconfidence about it. Entropion, ectropion, you should get nearly 100% success. Ptosis, of course, there is something that, that, you know, that comes over time, the judgment aspect. But if you keep the surgery adjustable and you're willing to take the patient back for a topical anesthesia adjustment, then that, if that can be built into your counseling and even ptosis comes good. So most of the surgeries, I, you know, uh, numbers are absolutely not important. In my situation, I'm not able to give more than a couple of uh, surgeries of each complicated variety. But at the same time, I keep talking all through my surgery, making points which are important for the fellow to learn. Not just the fellow, but the person who is not scrubbed in also gets to see the entire surgery on a large uh, screen television monitor as it happens. And every point is spoken loud and clear every time I do the surgery. So if ptosis is seen 100 times, that means that the fellow has revised the surgery 100 times over. Every step, the reason for every step, and what happens if you don't do it this way and do it the other way. All this is spoken about. And Akshay, when he was in training, he was with me for four months. I think I spoke to him nonstop for four months. You know, so of course, during the OT time. So that, that's very important. And when they make, in fact, I encourage them to make handwritten notes or type notes of three columns. First column, what the surgeon is doing and what, what instrument is holding with which hand, with the name of the instrument and what is he doing with the other hand. 
and the assistant on the right side and the assistant on the left side so that when the fellow goes back to his own setting he knows exactly what to tell the assistant on the right side and if he doesn't have the one on the left side that's okay but at least whoever is the main assistant what to tell them and what instrument they should be holding calling each instrument by name all that they um, you know it's by repeated practice but not necessarily that they have to do so many surgeries to get critical it's not like cataract or refractive in fact oculoplasty you don't the basic skill sets are there so there are 20 things that you need to learn which will take care of all your 100 odd surgeries oculoplasty has the largest spectrum so if you know those 20 things how to make an incision right how to make the suturing right how to do layered dissection what is your end point of dissection and how to get around a tumor how to uh, attach the levator back in its normal position what is the end point the 10 15 things in each of these if they learn those key elements then that's it ron the idea is for your new startup is already given you byju.com so visionary.com what is that <laughs> so you can have all these teaching going on instead of byju you know they instead of iitns and 10th 11th 8th standard being taught residents being taught by commentary from you all your all your residential teaching should be taped and should be played again you know in these classes no i just, you know dr santosh anavar's comments and tips during the surgery are so to the point standardized it's like a manual so Because that's what sometimes i Akshay, and we meet yeah. colleagues across generations like savri who trained 10 years before me tarjan who trained 6 years before me Uh, we all say the same things about the same surgeries because we've heard the same man say the same words over a decade. So it's 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 really remarkable. So MIT and Harvard can have. So why can't we have these lectures? You know, these are very basic. <laughs> That's what we want, sir. Basic, basic. Absolutely, we missed that out in life. A very important point that sir made was everybody will tell you what to do. There are only a few people who will tell you what not to do. and it's very important to know what not to do i request uh, dr mehta sir to give a vote of thanks uh, to the speakers thanks thank you very much for having organized this uh, wonderful session i think as i said multiple ideas which have sprung up from the new site startup idea that you got right now to the extent that how much what what all things i have learned the number of slide that dr santosh showed all those cases as i said not even 10% of them are seen in my practice phenomenal absolutely fantastic conversation akshay full of vigor and youth and enthusiasm excellent point from his website how he gets in touch with patients and they know they have done their homework when they gone yeah so i agree with him every patient who meets you by now has gone through your facebook and your instagram last night where were you partying and where were you smoking and where were you drinking and what did you do last night so they know that what you are where were you what were you up to so be careful what you post they have got all your updates you may think that they are innocent but they know what everything about you by the time they come to you so yes so social media use it to your great benefit that's a very important take home message we don't have to worry about any other influencers giving them you can influence your patients and that that's it and uh, the young blood doctors giving us my god what what so much of the invitija you had great great things to talk about brilliant i think uh, all in all a fantastic session by the leader and then by the other followers so you came up and taught us so much on oculoplasty tumors which is the most the, the biggest enigma and something which we are scared about you never going to see all these things thanks so much uh, uh, all the senior speakers for having come and spared your valuable time to give us this and gold session thank you so much everyone we are so glad to get such pearls of wisdom from our pioneers and so many tips and tricks from the extreme speakers we are seeing you all next in december at the annual irsi meet in chennai for a session of a physical session on youthful irsi see you all in two weeks Thank bye you. good night good night everyone thanks very much dr santosh dr akshay and vidya thank you sir bye good thank you thank bye. you namneet sir bye, thank, thank, you. thank you so much thank you thank you sir thanks a lot sir Thanks a lot. <coughs> Thank you, Namit. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Good night, sir. Good night. Good night.